This is a production of Cornell University. Great. So I'll talk today about controlled environment agriculture. A little bit about my outline. We'll talk about controlled environment agriculture in New York State, uh, a little bit about urban controlled environment agriculture, uh, and some new research that we're doing in this area, especially working with economists in the Dyson School. Uh, then I'll talk more about kind of the, the meat of what I want to talk about today, which is lighting in controlled environments. Um, and talking about a bunch of our research that falls under this uh, consortium that we call the Greenhouse Lighting and Systems Engineering Consortium, so GLAZE spelled wrong. Uh, we'll talk about LED efficacy um, and then some actual research with plants um, and then some more engineering or computer-based research. So just to get everybody on the same page, controlled environment agriculture is an innovative method of growing plants um, that creates optimized aerial and root zone environments with the focus being on production benefits. So high plant quality, predictable crop timing and consistently available quantity and limited environmental impact. We hear more and more about it these days, but it's been done for decades and done for hundreds of years of at least growing plants under some um, modified environments. Um, some of the, the examples we have traditionally greenhouses. Um, now there's some interest in warehouses and vertical farms and shipping container farms, which I'll talk about. Um, and often um, in terms of the, the root zone, hydroponics are used um, so that irrigation water can be captured and reused and you can, you can control the root zone. Um, but aquaponics is also uh, one of the techniques where uh, fish uh, are combined with hydroponic production um, to close the nutrient loop. Um, and uh, at Cornell, we have a rich history of research in controlled environments. Um, the CEA group was founded some 30 plus years ago uh, by Professor Lou Albright, who was in biological and environmental engineering, and Bob Langhans, who was in horticulture. Um, and so they set this group on this really excellent track of um, combining engineering and sensors and control of the environment um, with plant science and people that actually cared about plants and could monitor how they grow and advise on their culture. Um, and that's been a really productive collaboration. Um, I often forget to include acknowledgments, so I thought I'd better include acknowledgments at the beginning of my talk. Uh, here is the current crop of graduate students in the Matson lab. Many of them are in the room today. Um, so we can ask them questions when the question time comes. Um, and then um, in terms of our academics and staff, um, we have kind of this engineering sub team and I'll talk a little bit about their research, which has Kale Harbick, Tim Shelford and Michael Eaton. Um, and then we have research support specialists in Matt Magadam and Kendra Hutchins. Um, and our current funding comes from NYSERDA, NSF and the USDA. Um, and a little bit of the context for um, the controlled environment agriculture industry. Um, in the U.S. now, there's about uh, 2,500 uh, greenhouse vegetable operations. And we have to use the term greenhouse fairly loosely. This would be under protection. So it could be under hoop houses or high tunnels. Um, or it could be under, um, you know, sophisticated glass greenhouses with hydroponics and light. If we, drew, if we drill down into that 2,500 operations, probably 80% of them are the more low-tech operations and about 20% are the higher-tech operations. Uh, but in terms of production value, those higher-tech, um, larger operations make up, say, about 80% of the um, dollar value of um, wholesale farm gate production. And interestingly, if we look at um, New York, um, and I can't wait until we get the new uh, 2017 Census of Agriculture out, so we have new data to look at. But if we look at the 2012 um, Census of Agriculture um, and compare that to the 2007, in 2012, um, actually floriculture is a much larger industry um, in greenhouses than what I call CEA or, or uh, vegetables and small fruits in greenhouses uh, with a wholesale value in floriculture about 10 times that of um, controlled environment agriculture. Um, the interesting thing is looking at its growth since 2007, so since just right before the recession, um, floriculture is, is considered a fairly mature industry uh, with flat or, or a little bit of negative uh, growth um, versus um, CEA is growing by, grew 54% during that five year period of time. Uh, so, uh, 
want to show you uh, several photos of what CEA looks like in um, New York State uh, to kind of frame some of the, the work that our group does. Uh, this is Finger Lakes Fresh. Um, this is uh, located just across from NYSEG on 13. This was a greenhouse facility that was actually designed by Lou Albright and Bob Langhans uh, just over 20 years ago um, as a way to test um, the work that they, they did here on campus. Um, at a somewhat commercial scale. So this is 6,400 square feet of um, hydroponic pond production. Uh, when operated well, it could produce 1,200 heads of lettuce per day. Um, and the facility was, after a few years of testing and experimenting, it was turned over to Challenge Industries that operated uh, the facility for uh, not quite 15 years. Um, they closed down the facility a few years ago when they had a change in, in direction. Um, and we've been pleased to see just in the past year, um, a new uh, business has, has come over and taken over the facility, so now called Glasshouse Farms. Uh, the largest CEA operation that we have in New York State currently um, is Intergrow, which has about 70 acres of greenhouse production of all tomatoes. Um, uh, so tomato on vine, lots of um, cherry and grape tomatoes now, and some beefsteak tomatoes. Uh, if I remember right, about 20 or 25 acres of this facility actually have supplemental lighting um, so that they can produce tomatoes year round for uh, local markets. Uh, this facility uh, produces three acres of hydroponic lettuce. This is SAF produce. Um, maybe one of the more visually interesting facilities that I visited in New York because they have three acres of LED lights uh, lighting their greenhouse. Uh, the history of this facility it was actually part of a cut flower rose facility that operated until about 20 years ago or so um, when the economics of cut flower rose production uh, changed um, and really has moved to uh, Colombia and Ecuador. Um, the facility was um, idle or used uh, a bit for the intervening years and then in the last few years has seen a resurgence in um, its use um, and been retrofitted and now growing about three acres of hydroponic head lettuce. Um, this facility is uh, Saunderskill Farms in Accord, New York um, in, the, in uh, Dutchess County, uh, or sorry, Ulster County. Um, the interesting thing about this operation, um, which now has I think 800 acres uh, field vegetables, um, bedding plants, a retail stand, is that it's been in continuous operation and in the family since 1680 they say is the second oldest um, continuously operating farm in New York after there's one farm in Long Island that's been operating longer. Uh, interesting about this facility, I, I visited here um, several springs to look at the, the bedding plants and hanging baskets that they are producing. And this particular spring that I visited a couple years ago, um, I noticed that they were also dedicating greenhouse space toward growing. Um, these are tomato plants that they're going to be growing through to fruiting. Um, to get tomatoes earlier than their, their field tomatoes. Uh, and in uh, these rain gutters that are hanging up in the rafters, um, they're also growing strawberries, um, also for their, their local market. Um, and they can get strawberries about a month earlier um, than they would be able to outdoors. Uh, this is a facility I visited just uh, last week during a snowstorm in Syracuse. Uh, which is a good time to look at lights in a greenhouse. Um, this is Barone Gardens in Cicero, New York. Um, traditionally, they, they do floriculture production, about two and a half acres, um, where they propagate um, cuttings, so, so geraniums um, and all sorts of, of um, bedding plants. Um, they also finish bedding plants in the springtime and sell them wholesale, as well as their retail garden center. And the thing that I struck me as interesting visiting uh, last week is they have now uh, installed a crop of hops. So they're growing hops in the off season in their greenhouse uh, and actually uh, doing a, an interlighting trial with um, Philips. Um, so they have some, some LED lights that are above the crop. Um, because it is a tall crop with a, with a dense canopy, they're actually looking at uh, the potential benefits of lighting inside of the crop. Uh, and I would say the, the economics of greenhouse hops um, are questionable at this point. Um, it's a really new crop. Uh, but the, the angle that this particular operation is taking 
is they're actually uh, working with partners to build an on-farm brewery and they'll be having um, tastings and selling local beer. Um, and uh, even if the hops itself is, is not necessarily cheaper than hops they can buy in the market, they think that there will be benefits of having fresh brews and, and um, showing people the locally grown products. Um, this facility is Nanticoke Gardens, about an hour south of here in Endicott, New York. Um, traditionally also a floriculture grower, so they've been in business for about 45 years, um, sell largely bedding plants and flowering potted plants. Um, and visiting them a couple years ago, uh, I found this new crop that they were growing, um, which is industrial hemp. Uh, and so, um, uh, so what they're doing is they're actually propagating, so these are mother plants of um, cannabis, um, a particular variety that's high in CBD, um, but low in THC, um, so, it, so it qualifies through the state's um, industrial hemp program. Um, and they're rooting cuttings, which they sell to, to field producers that are growing uh, industrial hemp for CBD extraction. Is um, John Ferguson still the owner of that? So he actually sold the facility to um, two brothers, um, and they've done a nice job of keeping the facility going over the last uh, six, eight years or so. Very good memory, Don. <laughs> nice. Um, so of the, of the facilities that I just showed you, what are a few of the themes that kind of came out of those, those photos? This is where you get to respond. It's lights. not a rhetorical question. There were lights in almost every greenhouse, even if they weren't turned on. Yes, in the back. They were standalone. Uh, some of them were standalone. Some of them were gutter connected. Um, other observations? Lettuce. Yeah, lettuce and tomatoes, right, Mike? They're all on the ground. They're all on the ground, yes. Yeah, so those, those are all good observations. A couple, and lighting was one of the themes that I was thinking of. Um, one that I was thinking of is growers are quite innovative, and so I've talked about this relatively mature floriculture industry, um, but that means that floriculture growers haven't stopped growing. They're looking at other uh, crops that they're transitioning to. So like the industrial hemp and the hops um, or adding um, crops into their diversified farm market. Uh, let me mention a couple um, urban uh, controlled environment agriculture facilities um, located in the New York City area. So this is Gotham Greens in Brooklyn, New York. Um, their kind of flagship facility is on top of uh, Whole Foods, uh, and you can actually um, go up to an eating area on the second floor, and there's nice windows that you can look into um, and um, see the production that's being done. They have four facilities, um, uh, one in Queens, two in Brooklyn, and then one that's actually in Chicago. Um, when you walk inside of the, the greenhouse, as I was able to do, um, what, what you notice is it looks very much like a standard greenhouse inside. So here we have um, channel or NFT nutrient film technique production of um, head lettuce. Uh, but being on a rooftop allows them to grow in a place um, where they otherwise probably could not afford um, uh, land um, and allows them access to local uh, markets at decent scale. Another facility that I visited is Square Roots. Um, this facility is uh, uh, developed by um, Kimball Musk, who's Elon Musk's uh, brother. Um, and it is 10 shipping containers. Uh, and um, these are truly vertical in kind of a different way. So they have these vertical channels that hang down. Um, and then they have these strips of LED lights uh, that light up on both sides and light the crop in one direction and light a crop in, in the other direction. And a large focus of Square Roots is training new growers in entrepreneurship. So they um, annually bring in a class of, of 10 new grower operators, and each one is responsible for a shipping container um, and does everything from um, seeding and transplanting and harvesting and packaging to actually bringing the product to market and developing the market for their product. So uh, uh, CEA has seen a lot of interest in New York City. Um, uh, it's interesting to think about what is its current impact and what could be its impact in the future. Um, in terms of its current impact, um, I was happy to, to sit on the committee of Wiley Goodman, who is a master's student in, um, in um, city and regional planning. Um, and she has a recent publication quantifying the impact of um, urban controlled environment agriculture in New York City. 
And one of the things that she looked at is uh, commercial farms versus nonprofit farms um, in controlled environments. Um, and she was able to find examples of seven companies uh, that are commercial um, CEA farms in New York City, largely producing um, lettuce and leafy greens. Um, and herbs, um, and then some of the other crops that show up are microgreens, um, fish or shellfish, um, edible flowers, um, one growing strawberries. Uh, and um, why do you think that greens and herbs might be one of the, the more common crops? Low light, high crops. Yeah, right, right, high value crops, um, relatively low light needs. Um, they also have very quick crop turns as well, um, so maybe a three to, to five week crop cycle, um, so you get several crop cycles per year. So um, we often like to look at the yield that you get in um, pounds per square foot per week, um, and those would, those would produce high yield in pounds per square foot per week. Uh, I have a, a current project from um, NSF, from their, from their grant program called Innovations at the Nexus of Food, Energy, Water Systems. Um, and I was pleased to, to be awarded this um, grant to work with the uh, team of economists, um, Anga Raghurajan here in horticulture, um, and two colleagues at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, and kind of the macroeconomics uh, approach of the project so we're looking at the scalability or uh, how viable is it that um, urban CEA um, can, can grow up to um, feed those urban areas. Um, and in the project, we've chosen uh, five different uh, metropolitan areas. So Los Angeles, uh, Seattle, um, Chicago, Atlanta, and uh, New York City. And those were strategically chosen to represent uh, different um, growing environments or different um, heating and cooling environments. Um, and we're looking at the uh, water, uh, energy, and carbon footprint impact of growing uh, strawberries, lettuce, and tomatoes, either in the status quo way, so like uh, field production and shipping 3,000 miles, um, or growing in greenhouses with supplemental light within the city, um, or warehouse uh, farms in the city, or skyscraper farms um, in the city. Um, and um, we're uh, about a year into this research now, one of the early products of the, of the group was working with um, Chuck Nicholson and Miguel Gomez in the Dyson School to do um, the beginning of a, of a life cycle assessment. Um, and so this is an accepted um, book chapter that's going to be in um, flu food supply chains in cities. Um, and we looked at the case of lettuce. Um, in the chapter, we look at um, producing lettuce in Chicago and New York in either greenhouses or plant factories. Um, versus status quo in the field. So this was field production in, in Salinas, California. Um, and what uh, we looked at were um, the inputs that were required um, in production and then um, transportation to, to market, to get to a wholesale market. Um, and then we didn't uh, further look at the, the, um, the crop after it got delivered to a wholesale market, assuming that it would be a similar um, uh, energy and, and um, uh, carbon footprint um, after that point. Uh, so uh, a couple of the metrics that we looked at were cumulative energy demand. So what, is, what was the energy demand of uh, uh, diesel, of um, operating tractors, of heating and lighting a greenhouse or a plant factory? Um, and what we find is, is a field and shipping 3,000 miles did have a slightly lower um, energy demand than uh, producing crops in a greenhouse in New York City, um, and then a quite a bit uh, lower energy demand than a plant factory. Um, in a plant factory, there's no sunlight, so all of the light that we deliver to the, the plant has to come from electricity, um, and as well um, um, HVAC, so actually air conditioning that facility is about half, the other half of the energy use. Um, and plants transpire and extreme amount of water that has to be, that turns into relative humidity in the air um, and has to re be removed through um, mechanical chilling. Um, and so that, that is a large component to the um, energy demand in plant factories. Um, and then what global warming potential would do is it would look at the forms of uh, energy or fuel that are, that are used um, and assign a global, global warming potential value to them. 
Uh, and what we find is that um, a greenhouse has, has ever so slightly higher global warming potential than a uh, field. Um, and then similarly, the plant factory has about twice the global warming potential to produce a kilogram of lettuce than the, the field or greenhouse. Um, water consumption comes from um, published values in the literature. Um, and what we find in the literature is, is uh, about 10 times less water usage um, in a greenhouse or in a plant factory versus the field. So there's kind of some environmental pros and cons um, about producing in, in urban CEA. Um, what if we actually look at the cost of producing a kilogram of lettuce? Um, and this is probably way too numbers than we're supposed to include in a table. Let's look at the bottom line, first of all. So we have field, greenhouse, and plant factory, and the total landed cost to the wholesale market is about $3 per kilo uh, in a field, um, about $8 in a greenhouse, and $7.82 in a plant factory. When I first looked at this, I was like, wait a second. Uh, the energy cost in a greenhouse was substantially lower than a plant factory, um, and it was. Energy for operations was 46 cents versus $1.36. But how can it be that a plant factory is actually cheaper um, than a greenhouse? Um, and so one of, the, one of the things that you can look at is the land and equipment cost. Um, and in this scenario, um, we were assuming um, production in one of the five boroughs in New York City where land is very, very expensive. Um, and so uh, buying a one acre um, to install a greenhouse ends up being very expensive versus um, if we can buy 0.4 acres and construct the same, uh, uh, produce the same amount of lettuce in these vertical layers that allowed one to save on um, the land cost. Uh, one of the things that we are looking at um, in this work is also para-urban um, CEA. So if we go, say, an hour outside of the city, uh, what does that do to the, to the economics where land is a lot cheaper? Um, we, we have some small delivery cost, um, but nothing like uh, delivering at 3,000 miles to market. Um, and interestingly, so, so we've seen kind of this, this growth and interest in controlled environment agriculture. Um, I was able to find some global values for um, the hydroponics market um, and uh, worldwide um, CEA has grown by about 10% a year um, annually for the last five years um, and projected for the next five years that growth uh, looks like it's starting to slow down. So about 6.8% um, compound annual growth rate. Um, a different study predicts that there's going to be a 17% annual growth for global hydroponics equipment. Um, so growing systems, HVAC, LEDs, uh, environmental control, and so on. Uh, so those, those are some CEA operations. Some of the barriers to CEA, um, we've convened um, what we call our Cornell CEA Advisory Group convening uh, industry members that are producers, produce buyers, um, financers, um, suppliers of equipment. Um, and what they say the barriers to CEA are, are accessing capital, and that, that probably comes up as the number one barrier. So, so meaning it's a very cost intensive way to farm. Um, uh, building a sophisticated greenhouse, um, lighting it, uh, um, installing hydroponic equipment, um, ac accessing markets, so actually uh, finding um, produce buyers that will commit to buying your produce. So despite what consumers say about having an interest in locally grown food, um, the current markets are well served by traditional supply chains and it's difficult to undercut them in price. Uh, I think we have to differentiate our value um, and find consumers that, that want a value added um, product. Um, as I've showed you, they are energy intensive. Um, they are labor intensive. Um, uh, often not as mechanized as some of the field production that takes place. Um, and it's actually difficult finding uh, the educated workforce that can operate these. So it's kind of a, a new style of farming, right? So we need a grower that can understand um, computer controls, understand uh, uh, delivering to market and handling food safety. Um, and so those are difficult skill sets to, um, to find, um, especially in an industry that like in New York and worldwide is growing by 10% by per year. Um, and then poor spatial uniformity of the growing environment. And I'll address this with a, with a few of my slides at the end. So, so we say we're growing in controlled environments, but the temperature or light 
um, that plants get can vary greatly depending on whether they're in the middle of the greenhouse or at the edges of the greenhouse, uh, which can make it difficult to grow uh, quality uh, uniform uh, crop. Uh, so a little bit now about our work with, um, with LEDs and energy. Um, and some of the nexus for this um, uh, from our support from, from NYSERDA came out of the New York State Energy Initiative. Uh, this is where the state has declared goals for New York State that by 2030, um, we're gonna decrease our greenhouse gas emissions by 40% um, from 1990 levels um, and 50% of electricity in New York State is gonna come from renewable energy. It's ironic, I was just talking with my daughter about where she's gonna be in 2030. She'll have just graduated from college, apparently, in her, in her timeline for her life. And I was like, oh great, and we'll be getting 50% of our electricity from renewable energy by then. So hopefully those will come to fruition. Uh, <laughs> both of them. Uh, so, um, so in terms of agriculture, while um, CEA and greenhouses um, are not the largest agricultural commodity in the state, which is dairy, and then it's um, feed and forage to support dairy. We're in about the top five. Um, if you collectively put together um, greenhouse nursery and CEA, um, and we're a very high um, energy user. And so um, how will the state balance the growth of the greenhouse vegetable industry if it is indeed growing um, by 10% a year um, with these increased energy demands. Um, and some, some work that NYSERDA did um, to put some estimates on it was if we look at our current acreage in greenhouses, floriculture and vegetables, uh, that they may grow from about 700 acres currently to about 1400 acres by 2030, uh, which means that the electricity for horticultural lighting is gonna increase from uh, 770 to 840 gigawatts per hour annually. Um, so despite this, this increase and this growth, if we look at our greenhouses using LEDs, and then we'll talk about uh, should they be using LEDs, um, uh, there was a report done by the U.S. Department of Energy that found as of 2017, only about 2% of horticultural lighting, of greenhouse lighting, um, is using LEDs, and the rest are uh, kind of legacy technologies of high-pressure sodium light and metal halide light. And we'll talk more about why that is in a minute. Um, interestingly, if you look at vertical farming, which in, in the US uh, is quite small, globally it's a $1.5 billion industry. I saw some numbers in the US, maybe it's a uh, $600, $800 uh, million industry. 66% um, LEDs and 34% fluorescent lights. Um, so, so the best LEDs are about twice as efficient as fluorescent lights, um, so uh, they kind of make more sense. Um, in the case where you don't have sunlight. Um, and interestingly, there's this other large industry, um, which apparently is equal in size to the US greenhouse industry bill, is um, cannabis, um, which is said to be a $7 billion industry in the US. 89% of their lights are high pressure sodium and metal halide, 4% are LEDs. And I don't know if this can be true, but it's predicted to grow to a $31.7 billion industry by 2021, which is now only two years away. We'll see, uh, but the, the main point is that um, while we have LED technology, there has not yet been a lot of industry adoption in LEDs. Um, and so this led um, NYSERDA to decide to make um, an investment uh, that they call Greenhouse Lighting and Systems Engineering, which would be research, outreach, and technology transfer. Um, so my group at Cornell is the lead um, or co-lead with um, a group at RPI. Um, called LISA, the Lighting Enabled Systems and Applications Group. Um, so they've traditionally done a lot of lighting related to humans and really nice um, engineering of, of LEDs and thermal management and so on. Um, they have a, a photobiologist now um, that's done some nice work of translating uh, what engineering, engineers can do with, with LED lights to what plants need with LED lights. Um, and then we have a subcontract with um, AJ Both at Rutgers University who works with us on our electrical efficacy goals. So I'll describe this interdisciplinary approach to improving LED lighting adoption. Um, and interestingly, this is a project unlike say NSF or USDA funding, where we actually get paid according to reaching quarterly milestones, which I'm hoping doesn't make Steve Reiner's nervous, but it does <laughs> like some, we have to deliver uh, 
achievements or deliverables to actually get our, our quarterly uh, milestones paid. So kind of a new model for funding that way. Um, and this is the Glaze team. Um, so, so Tessa Pukak and Bob Karlicek at RPI, um, AJ both at Rutgers, myself. Um, in terms of the industry consortium and, and technology transfer with the industry, we have an executive director who's Eric Omatos. Um, he has his PhD in, in plant physiology working on LED lighting of algae at the um, University of Georgia. Um, and then we have a scientific advisory board, which is Cherry Kubota, who was at um, Arizona and their CEA group, and now she's at Ohio State forming a CEA group there. Um, and Bruce Bugby, who's at Utah State. Um, and then our token engineer, Morgan Pattison, who's at the US Department of Energy. Um, and uh, we have these multifaceted objectives, and I'll try to talk about a few of them. So relating to um, looking at and then trying to improve the energy efficacy of LEDs, um, trying to decide how to, with LEDs, we can turn them on and off in milliseconds and we can dim them. Um, and so there's more creative things that we can do than just flipping a switch on and off once a day. Uh, uh, spectrum and plant sensing. So with our collaborators at RPI, we're looking at the effects of different um, wave bands of light, and then we'll be adopting some of their research in the greenhouse. Uh, and then I'll talk about our work here looking at um, CO2 enrichment um, to reduce our need for supplemental lighting, um, and then engineering and modeling and pilot demonstrations. Uh, so one of the things that we did, this would go back um, three years now, um, is look at um, the, the energy efficacy, which we call the PAR efficacy, the photosynthetically active radiation um, that we get in micromoles per joule. Uh, and this was done at Rutgers University with their $100,000 piece of equipment um, called an integrating light sphere. Um, and so we had two high pressure sodium lights, and then we had uh, four different um, commercially available LEDs. And at that time, the interesting thing to note is there were only uh, two LEDs that we tested that actually were more energy efficient or had higher energy efficacy than high pressure sodium lights. Um, one of them dramatically so with these Philips uh, top lights had 40% higher efficacy. Uh, however, if we looked at a scenario of lighting a one acre lettuce greenhouse for a year, um, cost of the fixtures ended up being a large sticking point. So with high pressure sodium lights, uh, $200,000 to $300,000 to outfit a greenhouse, uh, $800,000 to outfit a greenhouse with the, the most energy efficient LEDs. Uh, they could save us uh, $50,000 a year on electricity. Um, so that would give us a simple um, return on payback of about 12 years. Um, which a farmer is going to want uh, a payback of maybe three years to make something um, economically viable. Um, we did find that you could grow nice crops under them. Um, uh, there we had um, uh, leafy greens growing under ambient light versus um, a few different uh, types of LEDs versus the two different high pressure sodium lights. Uh, and there's uh, no letters here. What we found was there were not statistically significant differences in biomass um, for lettuce or for arugula uh, between the, the light sources. So in a greenhouse where we have a background of sunlight, it seems to be most important is um, what is the total amount of light that we delivered to the plant. Um, and, um, and in terms of biomass, um, uh, we saw no differences between lighting source. Uh, we have since followed that up in a little bit more detail. Um, so we grew these crops on a larger scale. Um, uh, so this is um, the area where we grew baby leaf greens um, over a 12 month period of time. Um, we controlled lights um, to, a, to a daily light target. And what we did is we chose the best performing LED lights um, in terms of energy efficacy and the best performing high pressure sodium lights. Um, and I have some of our data. I haven't uh, gotten a chance to, to process all of the data yet. Um, this is for arugula and, and the blue bars are high pressure sodium light. Um, this is relative um, fresh weight and the red bars are um, under LED light. And one of the things that we saw um, this, uh, is that when we had kind of the shoulder season um, where we had say cloudy warm days uh, and um, we needed to add supplemental light to reach our daily light target, 
um, we actually saw a higher yield under LED lights. What we think that might be is just a temperature effect. With high pressure sodium lights, we get more long wave radiation, um, which was undesirable um, during those, those warm season months. Um, during the winter time or, or later fall, uh, we actually saw higher yield under the high pressure sodium lights. And so it could be that that long wave radiation is actually desirable uh, during uh, those winter months. Uh, one of my recent master's students, um, Erica Hernandez, also looked at the response of head lettuce varieties to LEDs and high pressure sodium lights. Um, and she got a chance a year ago to give a tour to SUNY Cobal Skill President Marion um, Terenzio, uh, because I must have been out of town. <laughs> uh, and Erica's great. She's been a great communicator. Uh, in this project, Erica had 13 cultivars of head lettuce. We also wanted to look at some of the cultivar uh, responses. Um, she grew them for three crop cycles, so from January when you would need lots of supplemental lighting through until May um, when she needed relatively less supplemental lighting. She had a NFT channel, so this channel hydroponic production. She actually physically separated them by about 12 feet so that there was not much light pollution between treatments. Um, and then they shared the same nutrient reservoir. And then she repeated uh, over these, these three crop cycles. And there were light sensors to make sure that, uh, turning the lights on and off to make sure that the plants got the same daily light integral, which was 17 moles per meter squared per day. Um, and you can see the spectra in this graph. Um, so if we go from 400 up to 850 nanometers, um, the Lumigro fixtures had 20% uh, of their light was from blue, 80% was from red, um, versus high pressure sodium light is a much more broad spectrum uh, light. So a lot of light in the um, yellow, orange, red region, and then that, um, that um, far red or, or infrared um, radiation. And um, interestingly, over the course of those three growth cycles, um, there was only one cultivar where Erica saw statistically significant difference in um, fresh weight um, in comparing high pressure sodium grown plants versus LED plants. Uh, and that was Teodore. Uh, what we, when we went back and, and looked at our observations of this plant, what we found is that under high pressure sodium light, the plant bolted earlier. So it, it started going to seed earlier um, uh, than its counterpart under LEDs. And so while we do have a higher fresh weight, it's actually an undesirable form of the plant. Um, and so some of those temperature effects of, of high pressure so sodium light come out from that. Uh, Erica also looked at um, differences in plant size based on cultivar, basically found this very broad range where we could get some romaine lettuces that were very large, so 225 grams, uh, versus uh, some very small varieties like uh, carmesi, which has a nice ruffled leaf, um, but four times, the, uh, four times less biomass. Um, and so these observations then can be helpful to growers showing that cultivar selection and their, their operation is very important. Uh, one of the things that Erica did a nice job of is estimating energy usage um, of that high pressure sodium light array versus LED array. Um, and we have to give some caveats. This was lighting a very small research area. So each one lighting about a 12 foot by 12 foot area. Um, so there could have been a lot of light loss to the perimeter. Um, the high pressure sodium lights are kind of uh, what we have at KPL. So they're not new high pressure sodium lights. They're old magnetic ballast fixtures with old bulbs. Um, and so the, the data that Erica compiled um, uh, based on the lighting control, we have the number of hours that the, the lights were on per day. Um, and so the first harvest, uh, so this was the cycle that took place in um, January and February. Um, the lights were on for 18 to 19 hours per day. Um, by about March, they were on for 13 to 15 hours per day. And then by April, May, they were on for about 10 hours per day. The high pressure sodium array used a lot more electricity. Uh, so about three times more kilowatt hours of electricity. Um, and so then Erica summed up the uh, total grams of edible mass that was produced. Um, and then we talked about PAR efficacy or lighting efficacy. Um, then we can calculate what we call biomass efficacy. So how many grams of edible uh, mass do you get per um, kilowatt hour of electricity? And what we find is for each of the crop cycles, we see about uh, two and a half to three times higher 
um, biomass efficacy for the LED fixtures. Um, and then, of course, over time, um, the less that we had to add supplemental light, um, uh, like that Harvest 3, we also saw higher biomass efficacy over time. All right. And uh, let me show one more uh, small piece of research, and then we'll stop for questions. Uh, so this was a project that uh, my student Jonathan Allred did um, during his master's degree, and he has stayed on now for his um, uh, PhD, where he's looking at strawberries. In terms of microgreens, these are uh, many different species of leafy greens that are harvested at the first true leaf stage. Um, and we see them as kind of garnishes at restaurants, um, kind of a, a high value crop. Um, growers tell us they can sometimes get $30 per pound um, selling them to restaurants. Um, but there's very little um, published scientific information about how to actually uh, produce these. And so Jonathan um, looked at things uh, like temperature and fertility um, and seeding density. Uh, he also looked at um, uh, light and carbon dioxide. So we wanted to look at what, how much light do we need to deliver to these crops to get optimal yield? Can carbon dioxide um, reduce that need for supplemental light? Um, but does it impact nutrition? Um, and so in these experiments, um, poor Jonathan. So he had these four mini plexiglass growth chambers um, and they were placed in these two larger growth chambers. Um, and he would use the larger growth chambers to control um, the light that the crops received, and then within the, the mini chambers, he could control the carbon dioxide concentration. So he had um, 16 different treatments. I'm looking at Jonathan. So uh, uh, daily light integrals that ranged from three up to 12 moles per meter squared per day. Um, and then within each of those, um, four different carbon dioxide concentrations, ranging from 400 to um, uh, 12 or 1,000 parts per million. Um, so, uh, 16 treatment combinations, and then he did uh, three replicates of each. Um, and so uh, what we see on the x-axis is daily light integral increasing from 3 to 12 moles per meter squared per day. So with mustard, we see this linear increase, um, and, and they may actually prefer more than 12 moles per meter squared per day. With arugula, we see a quadratic response. Um, where somewhere between 10 to 12 moles per meter squared per day, uh, we're, um, we're saturating their response to light. And then these dashed lines show us their response to CO2 supplementation. Um, so we did see increased yield um, with um, higher uh, carbon dioxide concentration. Um, and so like in an extreme example, if we had um, at six moles of light um, and 800 or 1,000 parts per million CO2, we could nearly equal the growth of ambient CO2 at twice the amount of light. And then one would wonder about the nutritional content of uh, this crop. Um, and so as kind of a proxy for nutrition, um, that was relatively easy to, to do with the colorimeter, colorimeter at our lab. Uh, Jonathan looked at total phenolics concentration. Um, and so total phenolics of mustard um, uh, basically doubled um, from 40 milligrams of galactic acid equivalent up to um, 80 uh, milligrams um, as light increased from 3 to 12 moles. So more light gave us um, higher phenolic content. Um, we also saw that with arugula, although not quite as extreme. So growing from about 75 to about 95 uh, milligrams. And then interestingly, and I think optimistic, a uh, good thing, is that we're finding um, uh, some of the higher CO2 concentrations, at least at the high light level, also gave us higher um, phenolics concentration. All right, so that was kind of a whirlwind of CEA and lighting. I think I'll stop there uh, for questions. For Professor Matson. Ah, yes, Ben. Uh, does CEA require like special varieties of fruit and vegetables, and are people breeding those? Yes, there's there's this whole breeding industry around CEA. Um, what I see it especially is in tomatoes, um, peppers, and cucumbers, um, uh, where they're breeding crops specifically for um, greenhouses with supplemental lighting. Uh, with lettuce, um, we're now seeing more of that. Traditionally with lettuce, you would take varieties that were used in the field and you would screen them and see if they work for your operation. Um, just similar to the, the approach that um, Erica took. 
Um, now we're seeing uh, companies that are actually breeding lettuce specifically for CEA. Um, and I didn't get to talk about um, Jonathan's work with strawberries. Um, uh, uh, so there is some, uh, some work around the world with um, greenhouse strawberries and uh, um, often those are using day neutral cultivars. So, so using ever bearing cultivars that can, can produce year round. Other questions? Marvin. So the plant factory approach, seems like it's efficient, but it takes a lot of up, up money. Yes. So do you mm -hmm. know anything about people that are putting the money up? Like, who are they? Who are these folks that are? Uh, who are the folks investing in this? I think these are futurists with deep pockets. Uh, some of the, there's a, there's a company called um, Plenty that got $200 million in investment in late 2017. Um, and I don't, I don't really know who their investors are, but it's said to be smart money, like um, not just um, uh, risky venture capital, the people that are expecting return on their investment. Um, and so I think some of our economics work, um, you know, looks at cost, but it doesn't look at profit, um, which I do also question profit. Um, but the thought being, it, okay, it could be more expensive to produce this way. Um, but can it bring a higher price at market? Um, one of the things we're seeing with urban CEA is they're kind of cutting out the middlemen, so there's less of a, a need for wholesalers. Um, and so one of the ways that they're getting somewhat higher revenue um, is by selling directly to, um, to the supermarket or the restaurant or the consumer. So you're investing your TIA craft money into the... Yeah, none of mine is going into this industry. Yeah. <laughs> Neil, would you like to see it? Uh... If Geneva has any questions. Yes, Geneva, do you have any questions? Thanks, Matt. Wonderful talk. Um, we do not have any questions. Right. And if we, could, if we could cool it, we could probably grow broccoli in a greenhouse as well. Sure. <laughs> we have the technology. Thank you. Uh, let me go here first, front of the room. Um, a question about the economics of the urban growth, what do you think are some upcoming technologies that would have the best um, cost impact? I know there's a lot of various things around um, ionized water capture, um, also systems that attach power generation to do mutual input output, mm -hmm. um, and possibly more mechanization with moving the vertical um, racks. Um, what yeah. sort of things do you think would be the biggest impact for the efficiency and economics? Yeah, so I do think there are there is a lot of innovation, and that will address these um, these um, high input cost issues. I don't know if it can completely address them, um, but if we if we remember the table of um, inputs, um, labor turned out to be a very high input in both um, greenhouses and vertical farms, um, and the assumptions assumed a not very automated facility. Um, and so we are seeing a lot of attention being put into robotics and mechanization and trying to automate processes. Um, I've been in touch with a robotics company in the Bay Area that's, that's um, trying to make um, robots that can um, move around uh, uh, stacks of um, hydroponic ponds and then transplant them, um, taking away um, some of the, the more labor um, expensive parts. Um, I think, um, Water, strangely, seems to be not a very high cost, whether you're in a field or in a greenhouse or in a vertical farm. Um, uh, but water availability and climate change may eventually affect where, um, where things are grown. So uh, it's one thing to be able to pay for water, but if there's not even water there to pay for, you may have to rethink where you're growing crops. Um, yeah, let me do the side first. Yes. Uh, you touched about the labor, and do you think it'd be easier to attract I guess people to, you know, like a greenhouse environment that, mm -hmm. you know, you might have a year round job versus like a seasonal job in the field. Uh, you, yes, right. In terms of labor, that's definitely one of the dimensions that we see is, is then it's turning from seasonal labor into to year round labor. Um, and we do think that is, is making the, the labor situation more se secure for these CEA operations. Yeah. Um, and Mike. Yeah. Your cost analysis for field versus greenhouse, you take into consideration the amount of money that was lost in the field from um, having to have lettuce, wheat, olives, <coughs> salmonella. Ah, right. So getting at like the food safety issues. Yeah. So the nutrition value and other 
factors. Right. So the question is, do the do the economics take into account lost um, lettuce from recalls, for example, um, or lawsuits from um, uh, from causing illnesses? Um, it does not. It would take into account kind of average reported yields from facilities. Um, uh, and farms often do have to have liability insurance, um, uh, which can factor into the operational cost. Uh, but that is one of the uh, one of the things that we're seeing in terms of the growth of the the CEA industry is while it doesn't eliminate food safety issues, you still have to care about worker hygiene and and the water that you're using to grow the produce and process the produce. It does give you more points of control. So. You typically don't have wild animals flying around your your warehouse or your greenhouse farm, for example. So we think um, it may be uh, easier to reach food safety targets in a controlled environment. Yes, Don. Neil, uh, more a comment than question. I recall another faculty member a number of years ago giving a lecture in this room on how vertical farming would never be financially feasible. Yes, so yes. It's mm -hmm. encouraging to see that things have changed. Yes, and we, we, um, we look to Lou Albright's thought process in many ways and kind of his plain devil's advocate has factored into many of the projects that we do. It's like, okay, what is the current status now? What, what is there left to optimize? Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan. There seems to be, certainly in the urban perspective, there seems to be sort of this hybridization of operations. When you were talking about plant factories mm -hmm. versus greenhouse factories, you know, plant factories have this energy cost, greenhouses have this sort of land cost. A lot of the operations, some of the ones that you so show pictures of, seem to be more hybrid. Mm -hmm. What of between those two sort of, are you seeing more of that? I mean, it seems like right. one operation I look at the city with the exception of something like Gotham Greens mm -hmm. is really a hybrid, not a plant factory for I know there's the tractor trailers and stuff like that all around. Too. Yeah, right, right. Uh, there is some of a blending, not as much as I might expect, uh, but the kind of concept um, that actually Finger Lakes Fresh was maybe maybe one of the first to try is, is the seedling area was indoors under light, so when the crop is, is dense um, and uniformity and fast growth is very important. Um, so that, that was indoors. Um, and then finishing of the produce was done in a, in a greenhouse where you can take advantage of sunlight. Um, and you could envision a larger commercial operation that like, like you say would take the, the um, waste heat that would come out of a vertical farm and use that to supply heat to a greenhouse environment. We're seeing that a lot in the Netherlands. I'm wondering why it hasn't over here. Yeah, I think the high capital cost. Um, we also see a lot more done with um, uh, geothermal um, in the Netherlands. Um, and I think uh, their, their geothermal climate is actually conducive to it, but it is, it is a high capital cost. Um, and New York has a more extreme climate than, than the Netherlands. All right, I'm at time. I'll stick around and talk to anybody who wants to talk. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.